Um, so welcome to everyone. We're going to be talking today about 3JS. Um, as Brian said, I'm Brianna Tersiani. I'm Jeremy Strong. And as I mentioned, we are both developers at Wanify. Um, it's a small startup out of Birmingham, Michigan. Um, and today we are talking about 3JS and just kind of some of the things you can do with it. Um, our plan is to give you kind of a very brief introduction to 3JS, go over some of the basics. Um, so I'm going to do the first half kind of just talking about getting started, what are some of the very basic building blocks, the setup pieces that you need in order to start playing around in this 3D world. And then Jeremy's going to talk about some um, more, slightly more advanced topics with textures and loaders. And then finally give you guys some time to actually dive into some of the code and mess around with it and see if you can make it do some really cool things. Um, so what is 3JS? So 3JS is an open source project. Um, let me pull up and show you the docs. The docs. Uh, that's not the docs, here we go. Uh, it's an open source project. It is a JavaScript li library that allows you to make 3D graphics in the browser. Um, so it uses a WebGL renderer and um, just really makes it accessible and easy to use. And it actually, for an open source project especially, has pretty decent docs. So uh, that's, that's exciting and definitely something that you should check out. Um, so our goal today, like I said, is after we're done showing you some basics, um, oh, we're also going to do some demos of some cool projects that we've done in 3JS. And our goal is to kind of work towards making this little, I'm going to refresh this so it's full screen. It's a little game where some frogs move across the screen, maybe, maybe, up oh, there they go. And you click on them to kill the frogs, and every time you click on them, they start going faster, and they get really nervous. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, and hopefully you guys can work towards um, making your own little frog game and then even expanding upon it, so adding things like a score or a timer, you know, if, if a frog gets to the end, you lose, stuff like that. So there's a lot of possibilities here, but just kind of working towards um, this very basic starter game in 3JS. All right, so uh, the first thing that I want to talk about is a project that I did in 3JS um, called Space Jams. So the idea of Space Jams is I'm using 3JS and I'm using the RDO um, API. So if you're not familiar with RDO, it's like GrooveShark Shark or Spotify. You log in, you make an account, um, and you create playlists and um, make music collections. So albums with you know, artists and albums and those, those songs. So Space Jams is a 3D space visualization of a user's RDO music library. So you log in, you, um, and it, it basically renders a your space universe. And so when you log in, uh, it looks something like this. Let me reload this. So, uh, and it shows you kind of your music collection. So I have six albums on my RDO account, and you can see there are six, that's small, but six little solar systems here. So you get one solar system for every album in your RDO account. Um, and when you click on an album, it finds that album in the solar system and it zooms into it. And so you can see on this XX album there are six songs and there are six planets. So every solar system has the correct number of planets, one for each song. Um, it also uses the RDO API to actually play the music, so you can click on them, you're not going to hear any music from right now, but it changes the corresponding song to the Earth um, and then it rotates around the sun and the, the duration, the time it takes to get one um, loop around the sun is the duration of the song. So you get to kind of watch these cool space graphics while you listen to your music. Um, so, and then you can, you can zoom out and go to the next one and so on and so forth. Um, so a special thanks to Aria who decided to change their API about a month ago. So right in time for me to be preparing this talk and suddenly nothing works. So that was fun. Um, so there's a little bit of the movie Black Magic happening behind the scenes, but that's okay. Um, but it's not fully functional yet. Right now, it, I'm the only one that can log in, um, but I hope to continue to work on this project so that anybody with an RDO account can log in and see it. So be looking for that in the upcoming days. Um, all right, Jeremy, you want to talk about Castle? Yes, and this is my hobby project that I've been working on. Uh, the idea is it's a castle simulation game like The Sims. Similar, there is a Sims castle game already, but uh, I want mine to be more economy based. Uh, so far, you can build rooms, which uh, have these nice graphics here. It's beautiful. Applause, please. Uh, we have stairs that link the rooms, and uh, we can even hire peasants uh, that will walk around the rooms and uh, clean them, provided you have enough food. 
taking them, cleaning out the garbage. All right. And uh, that's all there is to see for that. It's pretty cool. You can actually stack your rooms really high, too. I can show you that. But they'll, they'll keep going up. You can zoom out. I don't know if you zoom out. Right click. Oh, wrong way. And then stack even higher. And you can stack the stairs. It's pretty cool. <laughs> you can check that out. <laughs> all right. Um, so we are going to, or I'm going to just talk about some of the basics of 3JS um, and get started with this, this first document. So before I get started on looking at the actual code, I want to talk about my awesome little model here, which is the 3D axes. Um, so I apologize for how silly this looks. But um, so in any 3D space, you have your 3D axes, the X, the Y, and the Z. And so you have to start by getting oriented as far as what goes where. So the X axis is goes across this way. So on your computer screen, it's literally what goes across horizontally. Um, from your perspective, this would be the positive X, and this is negative X. The Y axis is vertically, so negative Y, positive Y. And then the Z axis is what's actually coming out of the computer screen. So positive being towards you, and negative being away from you, um, into the computer more. Um, so this is your X, Y, Z, and so we will be referring to that. Yes. All right. So, like I said, just talking about some of the basics, just enough to get you started. So there's a couple of pieces that every single project needs, um, and that's where we're going to start. So you can see at the very top here, you have to include the library. You have to include 3JS. So there it is, the script tag of 3JS, uh, including that in your, thank you, Jeremy, for the pointing. <laughs> um, include that in the project. And then all the rest of this is you know, can be in a separate script file, obviously, or right here. Um, so the first thing we have to do is actually build the scene. So we're telling it we want a new 3JS scene. So we're going to go over several functions and then kind of look at the, the engine at the bottom. Uh, so we build the scene. That's the very first thing. The render is what just you know it actually renders the graphics. So that's the WebGL render. Um, I haven't had experience with this, but I know Jeremy's talked about how we're using WebGL by itself is pretty obnoxious. Yeah. So anyone who may have used OpenGL, WebGL is pretty much exactly the JavaScript equivalent, and there's lots of heavy math and coordinates and draw lines and 3JS is just an incredible wrapper around all that that makes it uh, a lot easier to use and basically accessible to everyone. And it really does a nice job with a lot of that wrapping. It does math for you. So it kind of like um, our other guest was talking about, you know, you just say you want it to rotate and it's the same thing here. You can just tell it, you know, you want to rotate, you want it to slide, what is it you want it to do? Um, and the library takes care of that. So anyways, WebGL, so we have to use the renderer, so we're going to set up a new renderer. Um, we set the width of the window to just be as big as our entire screen. Um, so we're just using the inner width of the window, whatever your browser is set to. Um, and then we actually append it to the body and then return the render. So we're going to need that in, in a few minutes. Um, camera, so the next one, we have a camera here. Um, so notice here we're using a perspective camera. So there's a couple of kinds of cameras. Perspective is the one you use most often. It's what gives that life, like you know, things that are further away look further away. They're kind of like at an angle, that kind of an idea. There also are orthogonal cameras where everything is at right angles, which you would use more for modeling and manufacturing um, labs. Um, and there's another camera. What's one called? The six things. Cube camera. Cube camera. Um, and a cube camera is often used if you're trying to make bubbles. That's a, it's a good example of when you might use a cube camera, where it's like you have what's in front of it, and then you actually want it to kind of look like a warped scene, so you would actually use like a second camera behind it and wrap it onto the, the bubble, um, different things like that. So just used for, for creating really cool effects. Um, but the perspective camera is the most frequently used one, so that's the one we're going to use here. And just a couple of pretty standard um, inputs for that camera. So we've got the view angle, so the angle that the camera is going to be looking at. Again, 45, that would be the standard. Um, the aspect window, we just set it, or the aspect we set to just be the ratio of your window so that it's seeing the scene the same way as it's rendering correctly in your, in your browser window. Near and far or how close an object can be and how far away an object can be to the camera and it's still render it. So those are pretty big, you know, pretty big window here. Um, you can obviously adjust those if you want things to disappear once they get too far away from the camera, etc. Um, and then we, so then we actually create the new instance of the camera with those different pieces, uh, those arguments. And then we have to set the camera position. Now this is really important. In 3JS, where you have your axes, by default, it will put everything at 0, 0, 0, this point right here. So we're going to add, my example that we're going to start with today is just adding a cube to the scene and then seeing how we get that cube to move. It's the same with any sort of you know, basic geometric shape. So the same thing with you know, my other project that you saw, I was using the spheres. Um, so when you, 
um, set it, if you were to put the cube in the, in the scene, it's going to set it at 0, 0, 0. If you put a second one, it's going to set it there as well. And by default, the camera is also there. So if we don't move the camera, then you literally won't be able to see anything because it's all on top of each other. So we're going to start by just setting the Z axis, uh, the Z position to 500, which literally means we're telling the camera to zoom out along the Z axis 500. And by default, the camera will stare back at 000. zero, zero. That way, now we have the camera out here looking at that center point. So anything that we set there, it will be able to see. All right, um, now we've got our cube object. It's just going to take in um, one dimension, which is its size. And so we're setting the width, height, height and depth. Um, and we're here, here we're using a box geometry. So this, we're making a cube, but you obviously can make rectangular boxes, so it takes in actually three arguments, um, but they're all the same for us. Do you want to flip over the docs really quickly? Let me this real quick. Um, oops. So there are a lot of different kinds of geometries. So in the docs here, at the bottom, you can see here, I know it's kind of small, but um, you can see a bunch of different kinds of geometries. So the sphere geometry, rings, and there's all sorts of more advanced geometries. Um, so 3JS supports a lot of those. Oh, look, look at that example. It's awesome. Um, so you can kind of play around with any of those and, and see what happens when you use some of these other geometries. Um, we are just going to use the, the box geometry for now. So this is really important that anytime you're creating a model, every model in 3JS is made up of two things. It's a geometry and a material. So it's a mesh that is made up of the geometry and material. So our geometry is the box <coughs> geometry. And then we also have a wide variety of materials, um, some which require light. So they must be they're like somewhat reflective. Um, we've got shiny ones and flat ones and dull ones and bright ones and all different kinds of things. Um, you can look at those in the docs and play around with this as well. And then I'm turning the wireframe on to true so that we actually see just the outline of the box. Because when it's solid, sometimes it's hard to tell when it's moving or what's happening. Um, so I set the wireframe to true. And then finally, I'm actually just going to set this cube's model, um, which is going to be the mesh made up again of the geometry and the material. And then this line, which is super important, scene.add this model. So this line of creating something, this, this um, idea of creating something and adding it to the scene, we do this again and again and again. Um, where you create something, you make it, you size it, you have material onto it, whatever, and then you actually have to put it into the scene. So that's what sets it to the scene. Again, by default, setting it at 0, 0, 0. Um, we have an update position function. We'll come back to this. For now, we're not going to have it move at all. And you can scroll up, Jerry. Thank you. Oh, wrong way. Sorry, down. I guess this is the way I want you to scroll. OK. Um, and then we have an initialize function here, an init function that's going to actually call build the scene, the render, the camera. Um, and then it's going to actually create one of these cubes. So we have an instance of our cube with a size of 50, and then we're calling that method on it, which was build the cube, which actually creates all the different things and sets the model, et cetera. Um, let's skip this for a second, which is the light. And then finally, at the end of our init function, it's going to call render. Now, render is the engine that runs the entire thing. Um, re render creates a loop that runs every 60th of a second in the browser. And what were you talking about if the browser is? Yeah, so it uses, uh, the key here is request animation frame, which is a function that's built in to uh, browsers. Uh, all browsers, I think, now, even IE support this now. Um, the idea is that ideally it will call the function passed in every 60th of a second. Um, and that's the normal frame rate for games. Uh, that's why they made it. And if your program is taking up too much processing, then it will actually cut it down and reduce the frame so it doesn't like hog all your computer uh, and, and freeze. <laughs> so in theory, it's running every 60th of a second. Um, I ran into some trouble with this. I was showing you on my project how I set it so that the, um, the duration of the planet rotating and orbiting, um, so one orbit was the duration of the song. And it's if you actually time it slightly off because it's not truly a 60th of a second. It's close. but. It's, it doesn't really keep time quite that well, so sometimes I'd be like, wait, it's not hard, but it's close. Um, or it'd be like slightly too fast, it's slightly too slow. So, but in general, it runs about every 60th of a second. Um, OK, and then at the bottom, we've got a couple of um, global variables. And then finally, the, the init function is actually going to start this whole chain. So the init function is going to build the scene, add the cube, and then call render to update every 60th of a second. OK, so now if I actually open this. So let's see, I'll actually show you that I'm opening it. Um, so let's index start. 
Okay, here it is, and we can't see anything. It's dark, and if you went to my lightning talk, you already know why. Um, there are no lights, there's no lights turned on. So in Vue.js, um, I told you there's lots of material. The material that I mapped onto that match the material that is in the, the model for my cube um, is, is, requires light, so you can't see it if there are no lights in the scene. So we have to add a light to the scene. Luckily, this is super easy too. So in um, our init function, you might have already seen this. I had this commented out. So there are a couple different kinds of lights, the two most basic being ambient light and a point light. So ambient light, exactly what it sounds like, ambient light, it just, it's like turning lights out of the room. Um, it just kind of gives an even distribution of light all over. A point light is like a flashlight. So you point it at an actual object and it will create shadows and um, you'll see some of that different kind of stuff. So in Jeremy's project, um, if you saw in his different rooms, you want to go back to that, um, he's using a point light. I'm not <laughs> Jeremy doesn't use a map. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you can see he's like actually got this light that's turning on here and it's creating shadows. So like underneath the, like this part up here is not as bright as it is over here. So that's an actual point light. Um, so we're just going to turn on some ambient light for now. Um, and so again, here's that pattern of we create a new instance of ambient light. You can pass in a color. This is just like a light yellow or something. I don't know. And then, maybe it's just white, I guess that's probably just light, white, huh? Um, and then we're going to actually add it to the scene. So like everything else, you got to create it and then add it to the scene. So if I comment that back in and then refresh, we get a cube. Hooray. All right, not that exciting yet. It's not doing anything, so let's give it some action. Um, so I have this other method here on my cube object that is update position. Currently, everything's commented out. So. Um, like I said, it's pretty basic to move shapes. So we've got the x, y, and z axis. Um, if you just say this model dot position, that is, you know, the uh, dot position dot x, that is the position, the x coordinate. Um, and so what I'm doing here is just telling it that every time that I call this function, I want to increase the position by one. And so remember, I've got that render loop that's going to happen every 16th of a second. So all I need to tell it is to update the position every 16th of a second. And so in theory, this cube is now going to travel along the x-axis. Of course, if you change the x to a y, it would go up. But if you change it to a z, it would come out of the computer or go away, depending on if it was positive or negative. Um, so I turned that on. And then let's make sure in my render, I want to actually call it. So now it's inside my render function. It's going to actually render it and to draw the cube and then update the position. So there it goes. Go off the screen. Yay. OK, um, so because I didn't turn on the rotate yet. So if we want it to rotate as well, um, so let's first just do the x. So similarly, I can rotate it along any axis. You can actually rotate it along vectors. So um, when you look at my planets, I didn't want all the planets to just spin like along the y axis because that looks boring, right? Real planets don't do that. So I tipped all the planets so you can actually give it a vector and have it rotate or spin along some other line uh, besides just one of the three axes. For now, we'll just keep this symbol. Um, so I'm just going to spin it along the x axis as well. So when I re, now it looks like this. And it's spinning. Um, I can change the axes. So let's say I want to make this the y. And then it looks like that. Yeah, pretty exciting, huh? OK. Um, other things I wanted to mention. Um, just like you can, yes? Uh, the x and y in the model, is that the center of the shape, or is it the starting? It's an excellent question. It's the center of the shape. Okay. Yep, that's an excellent question. Um, if it were the starting, then when it was spinning around y, it would have been like doing this, right, instead of spinning like this. So it's a really good question. Um, and it does the rotation and then the translation, right? So it's like spinning it and then it moves it and it spins it and then it moves it. And so if it did it the other way around, it'd be like making like an orbit. Um, but it's spinning it in place and then sliding it along the, the axis. And the, the order is important, right? Because if you want to make an orbit, then you have to do. Is that because of you started the? No, that's just how the, the render does it. Yeah, so you have to do some more complicated stuff. So the, the orbits in mine are. Pretty challenging. There was there's a lot of math involved there. They wanted them to be ellipses, not circles. Um, and so I actually had to make like parametric equations and yeah, was, I nerded out about it. It was a lot of fun. Okay. Um, uh, oh, so uh, it, just like you can move the cube in any of your models, um, you can also move lights and you can move the camera. So in my project, um, <clears throat> when I do this stuff, so initially I set 
Um, I took a solar system and set it into the universe and started moving. You know, the sun is tipped. It's kind of hard to see. You can see some of the elliptical lines. Um, so the whole solar system is tipped like this, and then the, the sun tip, um, rotates along basically what would be the Y once it goes like that, and then each of the planets moves. However, um, once it's moved, like once your solar system is originally rendered, the solar system itself is not moving. This movement that you're seeing when I'm zooming in and out of a specific um, album, that's the camera. The camera is what's getting moving in and out. Um, and so I just keep setting it back to an, its initial spot, and then I reset it to like basically go to, you know, so it's looking at the solar system. Um, and so you can do some cool stuff with the camera movements as well. So any object, you can even rotate the camera and make someone dizzy, but um, that is possible as well. Um, and I think that was all that I was going to talk about. Did I miss anything on the basics? Okay. So basics, you have to draw the scene. You need lights. You need objects to be in your scene. Um, yeah, definitely draw the lights. And then just some basic movements. So Jeremy's going to talk about some more complicated stuff. Yes, I would love to take questions. Uh, just a quick question, uh, for example, in your, your uh, Space Jam, do you have to do anything on the code to make sure that it's not rendering stuff that's outside the view for it, or, do you, or does, it, does the library take care of that for you? No, I, don't, I think it renders all of it. So that's a really good question. Everything and you're just, so you're just seeing, things. yes, because when the camera moves back, that already has to be rendered, right? It can't then... It would have to like flash and reset the whole page, and since we want that to be fluid, I'm pretty sure it renders the whole thing. Yeah, by which, default, clipping is turned off. You can turn clipping on, and it'll uh, not render things that are outside the camera. Clipping. I know these people do that. Game. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's a good point, though, right? That that could really slow down things if you had a lot going on outside of what you were viewing. Um, that's a good point. Other questions on the basics and getting started? Yes. When your camera was zooming in and out, is the rate of change seemed to, it didn't just immediately stop, it was padded. Yeah, so like I did. Um, yep, so that's not necessarily built in. Um, whew, I don't even remember exactly how I did that. There's, it's some effect, and I like, I don't remember what it's called, it had a name where it's like, um, oh, I think I remember what I did. So it's, it's the way that it's you know, supposed to work is the closer you get to an object, the slower you go. Like, that's how they do camera movements, I guess. Oh. I learned about a lot of this when I was doing that. But um, so basically, I just took, I knew the camera, like, I had a set position for each solar system of where the camera needed to go, which is also not easy to figure out because it needs to be, like, I didn't want it to look straight on at the solar system, right? It needed to be kind of zoomed out past the last planet with the solar system tipped enough so you could see all of the planets, like, kind of laid out in front of you. So I basically made each planet and had its own camera points where the camera was traveling to. And then I calculated the distance that the camera was going to be traveling and then made it so that as it was getting closer to that, so as the distance got between, you know, whatever, um, so the, the speed was slowing down as the distance got closer, or as the length got further or whatever, I don't know what I remember. Um, but that was how I created that effect, which makes it look a lot less jarring. Otherwise, it was like, <laughs> you know, it's not as that's great. Yes? Is there any way to attach it to like HTML elements so you can do CSS keyframes or anything like that? So that is pretty tricky. Um, I know, Jeremy, you've talked a little bit more about attaching it to HTML elements. It's technically, I mean, it's all rendered in the canvas, so you don't have any native, like one of the things that I really wanted to do, um, which there's ways to do it, but it just wasn't that simple, was right now, in order to navigate this, you have to click on the links over here, and then it like, you know, looks in an array and lines up the numbers or whatever. And what I really wanted to be able to do was you'd be able to click on a solar system and travel to it, but that's difficult, right? Because these aren't each elements in the DOM. It's one big canvas, and so it's, you have to do stuff with like the hover and the intersection, and it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that. It's not as easy as just being like, oh, that guy's position, you know, it's, it's box number seven. Like, you can't, you can't do that, unfortunately. Um, but that's, you know, but, but that's, you'll see with the, the frogs, right, with their, you're like measuring, it's, it's like called ray casting, where you're like looking at the, the intersection of where you're clicking and where that element is on the page, and you basically are like projecting it into a 2D space and then checking if it intersects. Yeah. I don't know so much about what you do on the CSS with that, but. No, it's happening like. through, through the 3GS code. Yeah. Yeah. That's a manual process, that's finding the. Yeah, like for the frogs, you mean? Yeah. Yes. And, and like the planets, too. So the planets, 
Um, I'm not ever detecting like a mouse click on the canvas. But if you wanted to click on a uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so you'd, you'd have to check like um, where the mouse is and then like where, like maybe you can explain this better than yeah. I can. Yeah, <laughs> you, you have to find the relationship between the screen and the 3GS scene and you uh, basically you draw a ray from, well we'll get into it later, it's, it's, yeah. it's part of advanced detection. <laughs> would, would it be correct to say there's no hit testing? There's no what? There's no hit testing on the objects? Right, okay. right, yes, so not without, yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're like you said looking at the relationship between the two and then, and then testing to see if it overlaps with where that model's space, or where that model's position is in the, in the camera. Yeah. I have two questions. Awesome. One, uh, is there uh, an upper bound or limit to the number of lights you can have per scene? I don't know. Uh, what do you mean by like, well, like a lot lights. of times, you know, like you'll be limited in terms of the number of like you know point lights you have in any scene rendering. And I was wondering if they gave any guidance, like you know, don't use more than sixteen at a time, or sometimes you'd be like hot swapping lights. Right. Like, yeah. Um, I mean, the general rule is hot swap as much as you can. Uh, I don't think they don't impose a limit. I don't even know that they even do suggestions. I think it all depends on different scenes you're viewing. Okay. I think it's just putting as many as you can until it starts lagging. <laughs> okay. And um, I forgot my other question, so if you want to come back. No, remember. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yes. Is it possible using 3GS to import something made in, say, uh, Maya? Exactly. And we'll be going over Jeremy's going to talk about that. <laughs> Perfect lead up. <laughs> Unless. Okay. Um, if it comes to you later, even once you're moved on to the more advanced topics, you can totally ask it that. All right. Um, and don't worry, there'll be another question session. So Jeremy's going to start talking about um, textures and loading, and specifically loading other models that you might make other programs like Blender. I think, I'm actually not familiar with the other program that you mentioned. Maya. Maya. Okay. Yeah, I don't do a lot of 3D modeling, so. Um, but yeah, so so Jeremy's hopefully going to hit on some of that. Opening up this guy. Nope. Which one? Oh, so you want to actually? Yeah. Well, but you're not going to show anything yet. You're starting with the code? Or you wanted to show the frog sitting there by himself? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, talk about the background first. We're going to do the. Because then they'll show the air. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 okay. So, uh, 3GS comes with some built in loaders. <laughs> uh, the first one that we're going to be using is the. Uh, texture loader. Uh, it's very, very easy. Uh, if you've done this with OpenGL, it's just this just makes it uh, a dream. We uh, just get we pass it the URL of the local image that we have in the folder, and then it uh, assigns it to a variable, and we can start using it. So we're using the exactly same concept as we used before, where we make a material, and we make a model, and then we put them together to create. It. Uh, rather a geometry, and we put them together, together to create a model. Uh, so to start with, we're just creating a plain geometry, so. And what he's doing here is adding a background, like if you wanted a background image to the scene, so that's what he's working on. This, this uh, it's 1,000 by 1,000, which is enough to cover the entire viewport. Uh, we load our texture, we put our texture onto a basic material, and then put them together into a mesh, and add the scene, same thing as we did with the box. So if we just add that additional piece and then try to um, run it or open it, so this one is now called just index, nothing. And so let's open our console and see what happened. Um, okay, and so we're getting this error and it's a permissions error. And this has to do because we're now asking, because we're trying to load this texture, we're asking the browser to actually load an image, a file. Um, and so we're getting this permissions error. We're not allowed to do that. So in order to show, um, to, to import these models and have the, the browser actually open them and then render them, um, we have to host the page. And so we have some directions on our site for this as well, so if, if, if you want to do this in a minute. Um, but the easiest way to do that is to, from the command line, actually I'm not going to pull it up, um, is to run um, mongoose, is if you're, 
we, if you're on Windows, we have it in our repo, and then if you're on Mac, you can brew install it, um, and then just run it. And when you do that, and now it starts it on, because we named it index, it will start it automatically. We're hosting it on, or by default, Mongoose runs on port 8080. So now if I start that up, now we see the water texture that Jeremy was just talking about. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah? You, you mentioned the 1,000 by 1,000 was enough to cover the view port. Yeah. But I'm wondering, are you, so you're defining the scene. Uh, and then what, what units are you using in those pixels? Uh, so 3JS has its own scene and its own unit of measurement. Um, so that is something you have to wrap your head around in the beginning because uh, even though it's probably about 1,200 pixels wide, it only shows about, I think, maybe four or 500 units because of where the camera's based. Um, at least units on the uh, 0Z axis. If I were to place this farther back, like negative 500, it wouldn't be enough because it would be, because it's uh, zooming out and it gets farther away. So. Take some tinkering. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's, yeah, so basically, there's not really an easy way to figure stuff out that I found. It's just kind of make it a size, see if it covers it, make it bigger or smaller until it, uh, until it covers the area. You and want. if you're planning on moving the camera, obviously start with the camera yeah. as far back as you would ever move, you know, your bound of how, back, how much furthest back the camera's going to be and make sure that it covers that. Because otherwise you're going to zoom out and see the edges, <laughs> edges of your planet. Okay. Yes. So right now, is the camera looking down? Looking straight down? Is this the floor? It, is it always is in? going to look at zero, zero, zero. So it's essentially oh. uh, painted on the X, Y axis. Yeah, but down is how we define it to be. Right. Right. So we're using we're using traditional X and Y, where Y is up. However, n mostly they use Z for that. Uh, it all depends on how where you put your camera. Completely defines. So we put the camera here, remember we moved it out 500, it's staring at 000, and then we place this, so basically we just made a sheet like this. Good question. Can I ask another question? Yes? Connected to these questions, so you are running this code in the script tag inside the body, does it take the size of the body, and if you had an idea that was 300 by 300 pixels, would it take only that size, like is that the limit? So we set that at the beginning um, where we talk about that we want the render um, to be the entire size of your, your window. Yeah, so that's the, the entire, but you could make it smaller, right? Like if you wanted it to only be this big on the screen, you could just set that to whatever yeah, that div was or whatever. So that's the question, the answer is the question. Yeah, I guess, is it restricted by the numbers you enter here or the div? Like let's say my div is 300 by 300, you only have, uh, you can only define it in one place. So you said define 300 one area, 500 another, but there's only just one area. This is creating the div element right here. So. Um, but I think he's saying we're attaching it to the body, right? We yeah. took this render object. Oh, you mean if we try it? Like so what if instead of attaching the body, we attach it to a div that we already defined to be 300 by 300? It would just fill the space that's available. The question is more related to the, the 1,000 by 1,000. Those units, they're not mapping directly to pixels or the size. Uh, they're mapping directly to, yeah, units of measurement inside. These are mapping to pixels yeah, when you create. So yeah. 300, let's say 300 by 300 pixels, then my scene is 1,000 by 1,000. This is going to squeeze that into those 300. Oh. Yes. Yes. It'll, yes. Yeah, it does scale. scale it or is it just yeah, scale it. Scale it. Yeah. It doesn't. I see what you're saying. So the one thousand by one thousand is going to be my units, right? Yes. The whole thing deals with it. Then it's going to fit into my three hundred. Right, but it does. Um, it does scale it down. However, the aspect ratio it will keep it one to one. So if you make it three hundred by six hundred, it will show more. It won't scale it. It won't like stretch it. It'll actually just show more on the area. Shrink your plants down. If your plants don't shrink, do they? If you shrink the window that's running, and I mean, they shrink relative to. They do. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. The whole thing will look small. Yep. Good questions. 
tricky one. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so you're here. I am here. Oh, sorry, yes. half it on the screen. So this is. So we're going to start putting a frog in the scene. Uh, we should go down the bottom of the show, what do you call that? You want to go to the bottom? Okay. Yeah. So this is the same concept, but we're doing it with models instead of textures. Uh, this is, they have every kind of model loader um, for every kind of model type, I believe. Uh, you know, we support this for all of them. Uh, the one I'm using is the JSON loader, which is the proprietary model type. Uh, so I actually created this, uh, I downloaded this model, opened it in Blender, and resaved it, uh, exported it, and this type. Uh, it just works best, I think, uh, to do in JSON, but like I said, it supports all of them. Like, uh, Maya has some types, and I believe it supports all of my types and other types. Uh, so we just create the loader, and we pass in the URL, exactly the same as the texture. However, it gets a little bit more complicated, so we pass in a function to be called when it's done loading. Generally because uh, there's more to handle, but also because it will take longer, and you don't want to start using it before it's done loading. So on model load, we'll get called uh, when 3 js is done importing <coughs> the model. So notice we took the init call out of the bottom, and because now we want that to happen inside of the on model loader. So the model loads first, we call on model loader, and then you'll see the init has now moved to the bottom of the callback. Yes. So in on model load, instead of defining uh, the geometry and the texture like we have been doing before, it will give us the geometry and textures that it pulls from the model. Um, so relatively simple. We create a new material using a texture, which is the same thing we did with the water. <coughs> and we create a mesh, passing in our frog geometry and our material to frog. These two are because the model doesn't look exactly what we want to look. So um, modeling it in Blender, it turned out to be a lot smaller when you go into 3GS. So we scale it on all three axes by 10. So that's increasing it by, <coughs> increasing its size by 10 times. And we also rotate it on the x-axis uh, by 90 degrees, otherwise it's put the wrong way. And then after it calls this, then it calls it. Which is the same in it as before, only now we've added the background piece, and then we've got um, some, this frog. And so we're going to uncomment this which is going to create a new instance of the frog. Do you want to talk about why you have to do that? Well, it's the same concept. Oh, uh, you mean you talk about the cloning? Oh, that's what I mean, yep. Um, so this is just creating a new instance of our frog model um, and then uh, calls the build, just like we had build cube, now we've got build frog, and then it adds it to this array of frogs because we're going to want multiples. So this is the frog um, object up here. Yes, and it actually is a lot simpler than the queue because we already have all the models loaded in the, uh, in the on model load. So up at the top we see frog model dot clone and that's basically all there is to it um, because it pulls in the frog model. If we try to set the frog object's model to the model we loaded and create another one, they'd be trying to share the same model. So we want instantiation. So we just do dot clone, here you make it very simple and just create a brand new model uh, from the initial product model. And we add to the scene exactly like before. Yep, so now we add it to the scene just like before. And then here's our update position function, which again is what's going to get called in the render. So um, it's down here and currently it's just, it's not doing anything. Um, but we have in our render function, we already had these first couple of lines and now we've just added this for loop so we're going to iterate over that frog array uh, for each frog that we've created um, which at the beginning is just going to be the one and then um, we're going to for each one call this update function so oops, now we get this frog. a frog <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> okay, um, the frog's not moving because, like I said, we haven't updated its position, but it works the exact same way. You, you, you'd set the position, if you want it to move along the X, you move it along the X, you can move it along the Y, you can rotate it, you can do both, you can 
you know, do whatever you want. Um, move the frog in lots of different ways. All right, so questions on loaders, textures. Um, by the way, this is how I did the planets, was textures. So I had um, bitmaps, I believe, and then loaded them as textures and mapped that texture onto the material, basically wrapped it around the planet. Um, so that's how I got the, the cooler looking planets. Yeah. All right, yes? The texture on the frog, is that just in the Maya model or the model that you grabbed off? Uh, I it is separate, so it has the model object and then it has the textures. Okay. I don't it came know. Came with it when you downloaded it, right? Uh, when I export it, uh, yeah, it came with it when I downloaded it, and when I export it, it separates them. It's, but it's, it's in the JSON. It's referenced in the JSON. Model. It's referenced in the JSON. Model. Yeah. So when you load it in, it's gonna it splits out like Jeremy was saying into the geometry and the texture, and so that's why if you remember down here, so we're loading in that file, and then we have our callback of on model load. And that callback function takes in the geometry and the texture, which are automatically going to be returned by the JSON yeah, loader. And I should also note that every loader has a different onload, uh, basically, callback for what it gives you and what you have to make. So this is one of the more simple ones, but um, every model has some kind. A lot of them get uh, a lot trickier. So this is why I showed the JSON. <coughs> yes? So it cannot be interactive, right? So I cannot use the mouse to move the frog around. You can. So yes. this was the game that we're hoping that you guys might work towards creating. And so I know my mouse is kind of hard to see, um, so it's up towards the top right now. So when the frogs start coming on the screen, I can actually click on a frog. Now I've lost my mouse. Oh, and then make the frog disappear. And so you could use it like a game, and then the frogs start going faster. So it's, it's not elementary to have interactions with these shapes. Um, because this is what we're talking about, like where you're doing like this ray casting, where you're basically have to figure out the relationship between them. But you could make it um, so that like on mouse click, you can drag the frog or like, yeah. So let's say I have a CAD model, and, just so I, and I can move parts around. Correct. Yes, they have made um, editors that use uh, 3JS. Does that mean you can also add? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yep. There is some level of like, like when I did the when the planet changes to the Earth when you play that song. Um, notice that it blinks because it has to like redraw the scene. It doesn't, you know. So there's a little bit of that that's not awesome when you're adding stuff. But I don't know how much of that is standard with all the game engines. I don't know. No, it's not. There was another question up here. I was just going to ask is the JSON file how big? That um, I think this is a couple megabytes. We can check if you open up the folder. Yeah, it would open. Uh, this might take a moment. Resources. Yeah, so we have the file, which is the geometry. Which is, uh, ooh, it's small, 143 kilobytes. Yeah, so there's not many polys in the frog, that's why it's so small. What about the, is it the JPEG that's pretty small too? JPEG is 230 kilobytes. It's actually bigger than the, it's pretty high res, so it's actually bigger than the frog model. Uh, I don't know if uh, 3GS can unload compressed uh, files. It should be a, like browser. Oh. Yeah, I mean, It'll do it automatically with the loader? I got the network tab and refresh and see it in this network trace. Let it look like the JSON. Check. Yes, that's a good question. If you press that JSON file, it's going to GCF. I'm just curious what the size of it is. I don't know. Like yeah, kind of well, idea. you can clone our repo <laughs> and try it yourself. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, so 3JS has a list of exporters in the uh, repo. So you can, with Blender, you can import uh, Python scripts um, for the modules. And 3JS has one to just import uh, the module, and then you can just start exporting all your models with uh, the 3JS type.
Yeah, I can, uh, if we have a comment at the end, I can show that. Other questions? Yes? Yeah. So I'm noticing here that the, the, the texture itself has small circles, but the rendered frog has large circles. And I'm assuming that's because it's, you're blowing it up. It's Correct. Not 10 times. Yeah. Is there a way in the code to the scale uh, the reason is, the reason the circles are larger isn't because we're increasing the size of the frog. It's because we um, the. It must be the relationship yeah, between, yeah, the, the, between the model the and model. the. Right. Texture. So we don't control the size of the model. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure you put in Blender, but yeah. like once it's been exported, you have the size of the model and the yeah. size of the textures being mapped onto it. We're just not using the entire picture in the model. Oh. Okay. So that's what you would change in Blender. So you can't change that at all in here, though. I don't think so. Yeah. Within your scale, actually, in OpenGL, you can set the, the scale into which target and material, so you can set it set the yeah. scale and geometry. So I wouldn't be surprised yeah, if 3GS has that. And maybe you could somehow, once it was here, right? Perhaps, like in this yeah. function, maybe you can mess with yeah. the geometry, because there are separate pieces at this point, right? Because so you can rotate the, the actual material independent of the stuff after it's been exported to give it X, Y, Z, that you'd be with that mapping of the material. Mm -hmm. You can rotate that stuff. So nice. Guessing, uh, yeah, yeah, probably. I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff you can do with it. Yes? Do we have particle system? Uh, not built in. Mm -hmm. I did make a particle system for the project that I was working on. There are some out there. They don't always work right out of the box, especially because 3GS is constantly being updated. So, uh, I mean, I ran across like four or five of them, but none of them worked with the current version. So, mm -hmm. you might have to tweak it to make it work. But there's a lot of examples out there. Okay. Um, so, a couple things that we wanted to mention. Um, like I said, the um, the docs are actually pretty decent um, and. You know, like Jeremy said, they're always being added to, but there's a lot in here um, with good examples. There's also like a lot of people using it that have well-documented examples. So a lot of like, oh, you're trying to find somebody that's done this, and it, chances are you can. Um, so that's pretty awesome. So this is um, our repo that we were using. So it's hosted on Jeremy's GitHub. So it's JK Strawn and then 3 SemJS. Um, and so at the bottom, I talk about some, some docs and some resources. So the first one is the 3JS official docs. The second one is um, AeroTwist has a couple of like getting started tutorials that are that are really good, including the particle system. Um, I don't know if it still works with the version, I don't know, but it worked a while ago, two years ago when I was looking at it. Um, but that's something you can totally check out and it's it's got some cool stuff. It goes through a lot of the same kind of basic stuff that we did tonight at the beginning of the camera, the movement, like how do you actually set up the scene. Um, then this guy, Stemkowski. Stemkowski. Oh, is that right? Okay. Um, he has just done like a million projects in 3JS and has a lot of really cool examples, so you can totally poke around. So this that we were showing at the beginning, this is his project, this fireball. So um, you can check out this guy and his awesome things. Um, and then finally, a Blender tutorial. So if you were going to get started in 3D modeling, Blender is probably the place where you would start. Um, and so there's just some, that's their official tutorial docs. Uh, if you wanted to get started with that. So we were thinking that at this point, uh, if you are interested, you can kind of play around with this a little bit. So um, if you come to Jeremy's uh, repo or Jeremy's GitHub and then go to the repo, 37JS, um, we've got in our readme a whole bunch of exercises to kind of walk you through getting started and playing with this. So it says clone the repo. Um, the first one is the first one that I was showing code out of. So just the cube on the screen is called index start. Um, and so the first set of exercises are using the cube. This would be for, you know, if you've never played with 3JS, then this is definitely where I would start. Um, so it just gives you a set of things to try. Like, can you move it along the y-axis? The, you know, can you spin it? Can you slide it? Can you do both? Um, can you change it to a different geometry instead of a cube? Change it to a ring or something? Um, and then can you randomize, you know, its movements using um, just regular, you know, JavaScript randomizer and stuff like that, random number. Um, and adding a second cube, so like you would do with the, like we did with the frogs, add an array and then uh, be careful if you had a second cube. Remember, they're going to put them by default on top of one another, so you need to set the initial position. 
um, and then iterate over it to change the position of the cubes. Then there's a set of exercises using the more advanced one, the one that Jeremy was showing, um, with the frog. So this is the file we'll get you started with just the frog on the page. Now remember, if you're using the frog, now we're loading the texture that's the background and the um, image that creates the frog, and so you have to host it. So there are just some brief instructions here about if you're on Windows, um, we actually have the file in the folder that you clone, if you do so, and then on Mac, how you can do it with uh, Brew and Cell Mongoose. Um, and this will automatically open index, and then there's a bunch of things for you to try again. So adding more frogs and see if you can actually work towards that game. Um, and then if you are so advanced and get to actually shooting the frog or clicking the frog to, to make the frogs disappear. And so we gave you kind of some outline steps of how you might do that. So you can poke around with it, see if you can figure out how to get it to happen. Um, our final solution, that kind of game that I was showing here where I'm clicking the frogs. It's so hard to see your mouse up here. Um, that is index game. So um, in, the, where am I? in the repo, um, that's the index game.html. So again, if you want to run this file, you have to call it index in the folder that you're running Mongoose or else Mongoose because it does it by default. Um, so you can either change the name or um, move it or you know, whatever you need to do. Actually, don't move it because then your resources will be in the wrong place. Um, so lots of things to try and things to play with, and hopefully we've given you enough to kind of get you started and so you can play around with it and see what you, too, can do with Read Your Hands. If there aren't any other questions? I, yes. I was wondering if there was any uh, um, shortcuts for uh, either collisions between like basic geometries like box and box, box and radius, yes. and or uh, if there are any like you know you're setting the bounds of the camera near and far render distances. Is there any way to apply like a linear clogging over that? A lot of times mm -hmm. you can set the distance to a thousand, but then have it fade to black. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, regarding collision, Stankowski does have a great example of collision in one of his uh, example projects. Uh, other than that, you can, I believe, Box.js has great collision that okay. integrates well with 3.js. Um, regarding Fog, I haven't done that myself, and Stankowski might have something on it. Okay. That's probably a it's good question. So property this Oh, is it? Oh, yeah? Nice. There's like a 3D man. Okay, awesome. So another example. Okay, thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. Yes? Just a simple question. If everything is one big canvas, how can you test this at the end? Besides clicking manually. If you basically if you build it on Zoom or some clicking. Yeah, it's it's all manual. <laughs> <laughs> yes? More of a comment. We have also a testing course. I mean, it's more of a formal. Nice. All right. So great next resource then. Audacity. Definitely check that out. That's very cool. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So in like two weeks or something, we're ready to test with this, and I have a question. Are you amenable to like an email or something like that? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And you should be able to. Actually, I guess we should put up our emails, huh? Yeah. Um, let's see. Best place to do this. A notepad or something. I just would explain this way. Yeah. All right. So. Um, I guess I probably don't need our names since they're in our emails. <laughs> Probably the easiest way to get a hold of us. So, Brianna at wantify.com or Jeremy at wantify.com. Um, and then I can also put, so I already showed you Jeremy's, JK Strawn, um, and then mine, that's our GitHub, and then mine is Brianna Lynn. So, it's Brianna Lynn, but with a three instead of an E. Brianna Lynn was taken. Um, so, those are our GitHubs if you want to check out either of those projects. And Jeremy's Castle Games on his, as well as the, the <coughs> repo that we just made for tonight. Um, and then my projects on, um, on mine if you want to check out the planets and 